Welcome to Ask BIMCO on the topic of electronic bills of lading. I'm Paul from BIMCO's communications team, and with me today is Grant Hunter, who is Director of Standards, Innovation and Research, also here at BIMCO, and you are our expert on the topic. Before we jump into this 30 minutes of putting your questions to Grant, uh, there's just a couple of things that I need to say is that many of you have sent questions in advance, which I've got prepared here, but you can also ask questions along the way, and you can do that in the Q&A section of Zoom on, on your screen. Uh, if a lot of questions come in, I will obviously have to filter them and won't necessarily be able to put them all to Grant today. Uh, and also, we won't be able to answer every single question if it's extremely specific, for example, or if there are any legal aspects that we, we can't comment on today. But we will do our best to cover every topic that you, that, that you ask. Uh, so, Grant, first question. What exactly are e-bills of lading? I know what bills of lading are, but just let's start with that. Yeah, thanks, Paul. On the face of it, it seems quite a simple question to answer what is an electronic bill of lading. But I think it's probably easier to say what it's not. Um, and, and what we have to get clear is it's simply not a case of taking a paper bill of lading and scanning it in a computer and turning it into a PDF. For it to be a true electronic bill of lading, it needs to be contained within a system that provides a legal framework as well as the technology to support um, the, the use of this bill of lading. And they're, they're, they're sort of a very key factors here. It's this legal framework and it's the technology behind it. And the legal framework and the technology are there to make sure that that electronic bill of lading conforms to the three basic functions of a bill of lading, which is um, receipt for the goods, uh, it's evidence of contract of carriage, and perhaps the most importantly, important one of all, a document of title. So these things have to be enshrined in the system to make it an electronic bill of lading. So briefly then, what are the benefits of electronic bills of lading compared to traditional ones? Okay, well first of all, when we think about the, the, the paper world, what, what's wrong with the paper world? We've been using paper bills of lading for hundreds of years, uh, so there is a system and it works to a certain extent, but there are lots of inefficiencies and delays with handling pieces of paper that in a digital world we can eradicate many of these. So by putting it in a digital format, that means we can move that electronic bill of lading from party to party much more quickly. Uh, and certainly in terms of BIMCO, what we're trying to make sure happens in the dry bulk world is that the bill of lading arrives at the discharge port in time for the cargo to be discharged because that simply isn't happening in the bulk shipping world at all. And that's quite a key thing because it means that ship owners as carriers have to accept a letter of indemnity, which is a commercial and legal risk, uh, in order to discharge that, discharge that cargo um, at the risk of a misdelivery. So we're introducing a uh, certain legal uncertainty, commercial risk into the process, which we can address by using an electronic bill of lading because it's a much more efficient process and a much more secure process. You mentioned the bulk sector. Yeah. Is that the primary sector that e-bills of lading are aimed at? No. As far as we're concerned, all bills of lading should be digitalized. So okay. what we're trying to create um, with BIMCO and working with other organizations as well, is essentially to create an electronic, a universal electronic bill of lading. There's one standard used throughout the world for all bills of lading, so it will work in the liner sector, and equally in the wet bulk, uh, the tanker sector, and also in dry bulk as well. So all of these sectors will be addressed by common standards used for electronic bills of lading. Okay. When is the right time to move to e-bills of lading is a question that's come in. Now. Now is the right time. If you are contemplating electronic bills of lading, now is a really, really good time to, to move in. Um, the technology already exists to do this. The technology is not a challenge, not really a problem at all. It's been around for many decades. We've kind of lacked the, tra the traction to get more people using electronic bills of lading. But within the past few years or so, there have been lots of significant developments in the use of electronic bills of lading, uh, significantly changes in uh, legislation around the world that recognize the electronic bill of lading uh, as a legal document, and that has a big impact on uh, the use of these systems. So I would say now is fundamentally a great time to get in. These systems are simply going to get much easier to use as time goes on in a very short time scale. The more people that sign up, the more people start to use these things, the better it will get. So, you know, we already have some growth, but we want bigger growth this year. Okay, thanks. I can see two questions have come in already, so I just want to acknowledge to those two people online who've sent their questions. I have seen your questions, uh, but I think that they, they belong a little further, uh, a little further along in our session today uh, because some of the questions that have been sent in advance I've, I've 
adjusted the order of them to give us a good flow here. And you mentioned legal aspects a moment ago, Grant. Yep. What, what other legal aspects and how is the signing of an EBL uh, perceived? Uh, how, how is that planned to happen? Okay. As far as the uh, legislative changes uh, are concerned, um, there is a United Nations model law, of course, a model law on electronic trade records uh, that came out a few years ago that more and more countries are beginning to adopt around the world. Um, I think one of the first signatories was Singapore, uh, which is quite a significant development. It's a trading hub there. So they have legislation in place that recognises the electronic bill of lading. But most significantly, at the end of last year in September, uh, we saw the implementation of the UK Electronic Trade Documents Act. So English law is hugely significant to shipping. Uh, most of the, the, the maritime world bases its contracts and its contractual work on English law. Uh, and so to develop new legislation that, that now recognises electronic bills of lading under English law as being the equivalent to paper bills of lading is hugely significant, not just for the UK, but for all the countries and all the, the, the stakeholders in the world that rely on English law for their bills of lading. Yes. So how does that relate to your charter party? Should the charter party also be written under English law in order to use the UK? What, what, what's fundamentally important trade? is that the Bill of Lading as a freestanding document says that this Bill of Lading is subject to English law because then that will bring in uh, the, the, the parts of the Act that are relevant to a Bill of Lading. The charter party itself, I say most, you know, most charter parties around the world are subject to English law in a way. What's helpful in the charter party is if you have a clause where the parties agree that they will use electronic bills of lading and identifies what those bill of lading platforms should be that the parties agree to use and to cover sort of indemnities or risks in there as well. Uh, BIMCO has such a clause that's available on our website, but it's a good thing to put something into your charter party so that it's clear that both parties are digital ready, willing to use electronic bills of lading. Yeah, okay. So they're connected but don't have to be totally connected? No, correct. Okay. Good, good. So changing the subject a little bit, um, a question sent in uh, from a lady called Semin Chendia, I believe I pronounced your name correctly there. I checked with a Turkish colleague. Uh, today, most of the EBL platforms are blockchain based. Do you think that the users of these platforms may come across various problems as a result of that. And do these blockchain-based platforms require specific regulations too? Okay, I think that's a very good question. We are very sort of concerned with technology. Blockchain has been a very uh, popular buzzword in the industry since about 2017. How does it fit into the world of electronic bills of lading? Uh, you're quite right to say most of the platforms uh, that have appeared in the past five or six years are blockchain based. Uh, the older systems um, have a more sort of a central repository based based system where you just change permissions, but the bill of lading, um, you know, essentially is, is, is within one particular system or structure. All of these systems work perfectly well. I'm, I'm not here to suggest that blockchain is any better or any worse than any other solution. It's a good solution for bills of lading because of this unique record that you can't change, this immutable record that you have in, in blockchains. So a very good thing to have when the characteristic of an electronic bill of lading as a document of title, uh, you can only have one a personal entity possessing that, that bill of lading, that, that right to title of the document. So bill of, uh, uh, blockchain lends itself very well to that. In terms of how do you regulate all of these things, um, the way the systems work at the moment um, is that there are about 10 platforms available in the world that have been approved by the international group of P&I clubs. Um, and the reason that's been done is because the platforms have to operate in the absence of widespread legislation that recognise electronic bills of lading. They have to operate in a sort of a walled garden. So. Every stakeholder who will handle that bill of lading during a transaction has to agree to a, certain, a set of terms and conditions for using this particular system. And essentially they are agreeing as a group that that electronic bill of lading will be treated as a paper bill of lading for the purposes of using the system. So that kind of walled garden approach protects them. And, and that's how they've done it even with the blockchain systems as well. As we see more countries adopting legislation recognising electronic bill of lading, these terms and conditions will change slightly because we don't need to give that recognition because it's already enshrined in law. So those terms and conditions will change. But that's currently what regulates the use of these different platforms using different technology. So it doesn't matter if it's blockchain or some other technology as well, as long as they're, they're bound by the, these rules. So a follow-up question from Semin about blockchain. Is issuing a document with blockchain synonymous with signing the transaction with a blockchain key, can this process be considered sufficient for EBLs or is an additional mechanism required? 
Okay, that's a good and quite a complicated question uh, to deal with. At BIMCA, we're not so concerned with the technology that underlines electronic bills or lading system. We think your choice of system is something very much that is a, a business case to do. You, know, I mean, you need to do your research, you need to find out what, what platform, what e-bill solution best suits your business needs. Um, I say we've got these ones that are approved by the international group of PL clubs. They don't look at the technology, they simply look at the rules governing uh, the use of that electronic bill of lading. Um, with the new legislation coming into the UK, the Electronic Trade Documents Act, they kind of create this, this sort of new scenario where we need to work out the concept of a reliable system. What constitutes a reliable system when you want to use an electronic bill of lading? So they're not pointing at particular platforms, but they're saying it needs to conform uh, to certain characteristics, it needs to achieve certain things as a system. But in terms of determining what's a reliable system for future users, it's kind of been thrown back to the industry and thrown back to the, to, uh, the, the courts and the lawyers and whatnot to work out for themselves as an industry, what do we expect to be the minimum standards for any system? What must it do in order for someone to have comfort in saying, okay, I can use that system and it does everything I need to, for it to do in order for it to conform with the legislation and be an electronic bill of lading. Okay, so is blockchain something we're going to be hearing a lot more about in, 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 in future or? I, but I say blockchain is a, a technological solution. There will be others. Um, there are others out there at the moment, and I'm sure there'll be future developments. So we don't focus on the technology, and, and that's notable if you look at the UK legislation. They don't focus on technology because technology changes so fast. If you write it into the law, then you know a, you know, a year later it's out of date. So it's more about what the technology is able to achieve in order to meet legal conformity than it is about what is the actual technology. So yes, blockchain is, is certainly one thing, but there will be other technological solutions as well. Yes, okay. I'm going to combine two questions okay. now, because one of the questions sent in was what other organization is BIMCO working with about this, hmm. or organizations, more than one. Yeah. And the, the question is uh, that's just come in from Jing Ren is, uh, we appreciate that PIMCO is in the vanguard of driving technical opera interoperability of EBLs, but is BIMCO working with the industry on addressing, on addressing challenges in the area of legal interoperability between different platforms? Good, very good questions indeed. The fact is, BIMCO, we're a big organisation, we represent 62% of the world's merchant fleet, this is such a large task. This is nothing we can contemplate doing on our own. We do need to work with others and other associations and other identity, identities, uh, organizations. Um, it's a really, really large scale project. So BIMCO has joined forces with a number of other organizations to create the FIT Alliance, which is the Future International Trade Alliance. Um, so together with BIMCO, we have the DCSA, which is the Digital Container Ship Owners Association. And I think they are nine of the world's largest liner companies who have come together to commit to uh, you know, digital documents. Um, we have the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, which is a huge organization governing businesses all around the world and very much focused on digitalizing trade. Um, and we have SWIFT, the uh, banking messaging system in there. It's important that we have this uh, inter interrelation and integration with the banking system. And FIATA, the freight forwarders as well. And what we're doing together is making sure that we do have electronic data standards that apply to the use of bill of lading right across all trade sectors. Um, so we don't keep reinventing the wheel. We've got standards put in place. We've got standards for the bulk shipping industry, uh, standards for freight forwarders and standards for the liner industry. But they're all drawn from one common UN standard, essentially to create a universal bill of lading. And that's, that's the really key bit, that we're all working from one standard. It's not a fragmented approach. Although BIMCO itself is focused on the bulk sector, we work very closely with all the other trade sectors as well to make sure we all do this uh, you know, joined up thinking. So yes, it's a very, very key role for us and it's very much a, a unified approach to, to getting e-bills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe more. this FIT or FIT Alliance yeah. has its own website and its own LinkedIn profile you can follow, is that right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. We Just at the end of last year, we uh, launched our own website, uh, fitalliance.org. I can't remember if there's a hyphen in there somewhere, but uh, there is a, a website that contains uh, bits and pieces of information, very useful guides on you know how do you get started with bills of lading if you're in the bulk sector or the liner industry, a little bit of background about the sort of the legal status uh, around various jurisdictions around the world. Yes. Um, and that's something we're gonna increase information on in the future, we'll be putting videos of other pieces of information on there but just to sort of demonstrate to uh, not just the shipping industry but to the banking sector as well and to commodity traders that this is very much joined up thinking and unified approach 
uh, to getting e-bills accepted. Okay, which reminds me that actually uh, to our audience, remember to follow us on LinkedIn, just look for BIMCO and follow the Fit Alliance if you're interested in this subject uh, for that. And uh, for anyone who's joined us since we started, uh, my name is Paul, I'm from BIMCO Communications and this is Grant Hunter, who is Director of Standards, Innovation and Research at BIMCO here. And uh, you're our expert on the topic of e-bills of lading, electronic bills of lading, and what we're doing today is taking questions from our audience and uh, many of them have been sent in in advance. But moving to some that have been sent in just now online, um, Jose Gonzalez says, we're working on a document layered solution for global trade. How can we help bring awareness and adoption to the US market? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't think I even have an answer for that. I mean, <laughs> that's down to your kind of own, own marketing uh, aspects, I guess. I mean, BIMCO does not endorse particular commercial solutions. That's not our role here as well. Um, you know, it, it's for businesses to decide what's best for them. So we can tell them about what technology is available, but it's not for us to say one is better than the other, uh, although there are new things uh, you know, happening. We can make people aware of things and raise awareness and educate people, but we can't endorse particular products. Um, all we're here to do is to get the message out to the world as best we can to just explain what the benefits of the electronic bill of lading are uh, and what systems are available. But beyond that, we we're not really here to sort of endorse particular products as such. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd just like to say that a couple of questions have come in with relation to, related to sanctions and EBLs. And I, and I have to say that I'm sorry, that's not a topic we can go into today. That's, uh, there are too many legal aspects there. Uh, so I'm not going to be able to put those questions to Grant today, but please keep other questions coming in. And the next one is, what are the risks of using electronic bills of lading compared to normal ones? Okay, are there any well, risks? There are risks with everything, Paul. Risks with everything. <laughs> Let's start with a piece of paper, the paper bill of lading. Um, I say it's been around for hundreds of years. People are very confident in holding on to a piece of paper. I've actually got it here. So here is a paper bill of lading. Very thin piece of paper. This is a Congen bill dating back to 1978. So that's 45 years old, this piece of paper. It doesn't um, look at it. It doesn't look at it. It's all very well preserved, a bit like myself. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the piece of paper, people, the industry has relied on it for so many years. Um, it's a system that, that's out there and, and people often feel very comfortable with something they can hold on to, especially when it's something that represents a huge value. Because you think about, you know, an iron ore cargo going on this, it's worth millions and millions of dollars. And if you are the possessor of this piece of paper and have documents of title or have title to the goods, then that's a very, very valuable piece of paper. You want to hold on to something. In the electronic world, we, we, it's a non-tangible thing. It's a bit more difficult for us perhaps to get our sort of heads around the fact that something on our screen is legally equivalent to this. But the fact is this piece of paper, you have to move it around the world. That's one of the big, big problems. So that you have to get this filled in by the master or the agent and it has to be sent through a series of stakeholders before it eventually arrives back at the discharge port. So that's gonna involve transporting this amongst many other pieces of paper around the world. Not exactly good for the planet, great for couriers and things, but not good for the planet. It's also a very simple piece of paper. Now, to my mind, that your average 12-year-old with a, a printer and a couple of rubber stamps could produce a very genuine looking paper bill of lading. Does that happen? Oh, yes. Okay. We often we hear cases that basically people will produce multiple copies of a bill of lading, then they'll go to various banks and raise trade finance, get credit yeah. on it, but it's for the same cargo essentially, it's just multiple copies. So it's in terms of fraud, it's a very low level of entry. If you want to sort of commit a fraud on the bill, paper bill of lading, it's pretty easy to do. Kind of like forging a signature on a check. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Who's to know? So, I mean, yeah. you know, people got rubber stamps and everything, but they're, they're all easy to do. It's, it's really low level entry thing. You know, it, it doesn't require uh, too many skills to get into the paper or to commit a fraud. In the electronic world, you know, it's not without its risk. We also hear risks of, sort of cyber security, all these sort of things. But to my mind, yes, there are risks in the electronic world and the risks in the paper world. But in the electronic world, the entry level to fraud is much, much higher. You have to be significantly more uh, knowledgeable and expert player to break into you know, one of these systems. It's like sort of breaking into a banking system. It's much harder to do. It's not impossible, perhaps. Um, so a risks exists. Um, but we feel it's a lower risk compared to the risk of fraud in the paper world. So, yeah, we have to balance these risks out. We, we think this, this, the risk in the digital world is far, far lower. Your documents are much more secure. And of course, one of the big benefits in the electronic world is that unlike a piece of paper, you can track an electronic document. You can know where it is and 
who it belongs to at any particular given uh, time. Once this goes into a system somewhere, they often never reappear. Yeah. They certainly don't arrive at the discharge port. They get lost in this system where it's being checked by somebody somewhere. And that's and where you up. need the letters of indemnity. That's where you end up yes. needing the letters of indemnity yeah. because this really important document hasn't arrived at the discharge port. Yes. It simply got lost in the system. Yeah. The electronic bill of lading does away with many of these problems and so helps reduce this commercial and legal risk that's, that's very widespread in, in yes. the bulk shipping sector. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, Will it be password protected? And if it is protected, who will get its password? It's kind of a follow-up question to what you were just saying. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's actually much more complicated than that, isn't it? No, I, th I think it's a slightly different angle than yeah. what we're talking about. One is kind of um, security, how secure it is an electronic bill of lading compared to a paper bill. I think they are much more secure. The second question relates to access. So you have a platform on which you're using electronic bills of lading. Um, these are sort of enclosed systems. So what you have is people with having access to the system rather than the electronic bill of lading being passed from system to system like an email attachment. At the moment, they all stay within the same system. But secure access is fundamentally important as well. But this often gets comes back to the, the users of the system. It's not a flaw with the systems itself, but like any system, if you've got, got to go in and do information, but you don't use it that often, it's not uncommon for people to get a yellow post-it note and write their username or password and stick it to the screen. That's breaking down you know, the security for the access. So these are things we need to, need to control more tightly. So you know, um, the very sort of two-factor you know, verification authentication processes that are in place now for lots of software. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we need similar things like this. They're, they're probably in place already for many of these systems. So we can you know, restrict access as we need okay. to. So I don't okay. really see that as a, a major yeah. issue, but okay. it is something for yeah. individual users yeah. to, to- It just struck me that simple password protection is a bit old fashioned. It's a bit old fashioned these days, yeah. 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 yeah, okay, good. Um, question from a broker, what would, be our direct action when preparing a charter party, including the issuance of EBLs. What do we have to have in mind? Have we gone into that in an earlier question? Not really. Not really. I, mean, I think you say if, you, if you're a broker and you've been asked to uh, prepare the charter party, well, we have separate mm -hmm. electronic systems for that. You know, BIMCO has its SmartCon system that will take you through the entire process of putting a charter party together and adding your rider clauses and whatnot. In terms of issuing uh, an electronic bill of lading, you need to subscribe to one of the existing platforms to do that. I mean, that's the whole point. You sign up to a system and that will give you access to templates for bills of lading. You will put your information in there and all the various stakeholders and it starts upon the process. But the first step is to simply to subscribe to these systems. And once you're in it, you will get notifications when changes need to be made to the bill of lading or if it's reached a particular point, if it's you know, you know, been suddenly received at the discharge port or whatnot, you will get that through the system itself. So it isn't something you're creating yourself on your own computer uh, and then sending it somewhere else. You're actually logging into a platform and doing it all through that platform mm -hmm. and other people will have access to it depending on their, their, their sort of uh, yes. role in the process. Yeah, okay. I can see blockchain is a popular topic Yeah. because there are two questions now related to blockchain. The first one is, how do you see emerging tech like blockchain, IoT and artificial intelligence revolutionizing the current ancient system of bills of lading? I think going back to the start of this conversation, it might surprise people to know that the technology to issue electronic bills of lading has been around for probably 30 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that technology works perfectly well. Um, we, the technology has changed over time. I say there's new players come onto the market that have used blockchain solutions. They also work equally well. But, you know, it's kind of tried and tested technology in terms of using an electronic bill of lading. So, you know, we've learned a lot from these experiences over time. So we can be fairly comfortable with it all. In terms of other technologies that you might apply, like AI, I say as long as it conforms with uh, the legislation or the rules of the, the, you know, the terms of use of a particular platform, it's fine. I mean, all these things will simply enhance and speed up the process and make it more efficient. So I think, you know, as I say, there's a lot happening in the AI world at the moment, really exciting prospects for streamlining a lot of processes, getting rid, rid of a lot of, you know, dull, boring, labor intensive work. So yes, people will be looking to make, to make use of these things uh, and they will simply help make the process of using an electronic bill of lading even better and really discourage people away from paper in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So just a very quick question, kind of, I think was a supplement to the, the previous question. 
can we provide a basic explanation or example of the EBL verification process on blockchain? Or is that a bit too technical uh, no. for today? No, we can't. A, it's too technical for me. B, I'm, I'm not entirely concerned with it. I mean, I think, I think if you want to understand the blockchain verification process for an e-bill under one of the platforms. Go and talk to one of the platforms. They're really nice, friendly people. We talk to them all the time. Just go and talk to one of those that use uh, blockchain and they'll be happy to explain the process and how it works and how they put the verification process in place and all their checks. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a secretive thing at all. We want people to use these systems. We want people to be comfortable with using them. Um, but also, you know, I think from my point of view, I'd like to think we get to the point in the industry where people no longer talk about the underlying technology at all. Um, at the moment, we have a set of systems that can only operate independently. You cannot issue a bill of lading under one platform and then move it to another one and then eventually for it to come back to the, to the original ones once the goods are received. We don't have this concept of interoperability. But it's an important thing to have. And there's a lot of work being done last year on this interoperability thing. Technologically, it can be done uh, relatively easily. That's not a problem at all. But the legal interoperability aspect oh, okay. is the challenge. Yeah. So it's not just a technical thing. It's not just a technical thing. We have to know, well, you know, if this is a document of title, how can we absolutely guarantee yeah. who possesses it at any one time and that there is only one possession, that you don't have multiple copies. Yeah. So it's, it's like, a bit like sort of cryptocurrency type thing. You, can only, you can't copy this thing. Yeah. So like when mobile one. phones first came out, you could only talk to someone on the same network. Exactly, that yes, sort of yeah, thing. They yeah. had to join themselves together, but yeah. also agree contractual terms. Yeah. yeah, so ideally, I guess what we'd like to get to the, the, the point of is that rather than companies having to subscribe perhaps to more than one platform because their customers use different ones, um, you could just subscribe to a single platform and you don't care what other platforms are being used. So it's like me sending, using Outlook, Microsoft Outlook, to send you an email attachment and you're using Gmail. Yeah. I don't need to know or care that you're using Gmail, but I know you will receive my email and you'll be able to open the attachment. Yes. And that's fundamentally what's important to business, yeah. not necessarily the underlying technology yes. bit, which will change over time. Although equally, to, to use that mobile phone analogy from years ago, it used to be like that with email platforms, is that you couldn't be sure yeah, exactly. how it was going yeah. to look. Yeah. Uh, but these days you can. Yeah. So that time will eventually come with EBLs. Yes. And yeah. that's all been achieved through agreeing industry standards, yes. yeah. which again is a, the main part of a lot yeah. of the work we're doing is agreeing what these yeah. standards should yeah. be for yeah. electronic bills of lady. Yeah. So there are two questions about these standards. Oh, okay. First one is, is there any plan to present EBLs in a structured docu document format like JSON? Uh, we have a, a, a data set that, that sets out the, the structure of an electronic bill of lading. It's available to uh, download from BIMCO's website. You can certainly have a look at that. And that's what's been shared with all of the existing platforms. And any new platforms are coming onto the scene as well. We're sharing this common standard data set for electronic bills of lading because we believe that's what should be in place for all of the platforms once we get interoperability using. So yes, if that bill yeah. of lading is going to move between platforms, yes. let's make sure it conforms to a standard and we don't put in yeah. extra layers of work in converting mm -hmm. the format or arrangement. Okay. So, so that work has been done to, a, to an extent. So therefore, how compatible is BIMCO's EBL data standards with other standards like the ICC's key trade documents and data elements? We are all working together in one big happy family, <laughs> all of us. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking to the ICC and their key documents as well. We're talking to the DCSA, we're talking to the UNC fact to make sure we have this common standard in the industry. And that's absolutely vital to making yeah. all of this work. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a huge amount of dialogue okay. goes in uh, to make sure there isn't any duplication or yes. effort or, you know, a fragmented approach. We're taking very much a, a common approach to establishing yes. these standards. Yeah. yeah. We're got about two and a bit minutes left and I just want to go through some so the last couple of questions I can see some more have still come in but we haven't got time to answer everybody's question I'm sorry um, are banks as eager as carriers and others to sign up to these platforms the banks um, yeah tradition I think when we first started this this process with BIMCO over a year and a half ago uh, the banks were often seen as kind of the baddies in all this they're the ones that didn't want to move on to this technology they were often pointed at, the finger was pointed at them as being yeah. the stumbling block. Um, but increasingly in, in, in the past six months or so, we are seeing more and more banks signing up and giving their support to this initiative to start to use electronic bills of lading. Um, and I think they, they do now realize that this is how we move ahead as an industry. This is how we yes. get new opportunities for growth. Yes. Uh, we get more efficiencies through electronic bills of lading and other trade documents as well. Okay. So the banks are coming on board now. Yes, okay. Quick question, what are the costs for using this for banks and for consignees? 
And that will vary from platform to platform. And again, it's not something we involve ourselves with. It's a business decision. You choose a platform. Uh, they're obviously going to quote you a tariff or a price mm -hmm. for using these systems. At what point they make their charge is entirely down to them, whether it's yes. the banks or the shippers. Uh, are charged, uh, that, that's really uh, their thing. Yes, yeah. And what we're generally aware of is if you're a carrier, a ship owner, normally you are not charged anything to use the system. You can subscribe okay. free of charge. Good. You're the one sort okay. of physically issuing it, but it's really come, it's the shipper's decision to use Good. an okay. electronic bill of right. lading. So normally there isn't a charge right. if you're right. a carrier. We have less than a minute left. Okay. So in about 30 seconds, can you tell us about the 25 by 25 pledge? Just I think we mentioned it briefing. Yeah, very, no, 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 certainly. Yeah. This, this, is, yeah, this is a really big initiative for us. It's a campaign to raise awareness of electronic bills of lading in the bulk shipping sector. And what we've done, uh, we've got the backing of four of the world's largest mining companies, BHP, Valley, Rio Tinto and Anglo-American, um, to commit to shipping 25% of their annual trade volume of iron ore on electronic bills of lading by 2025 next year. It's a very short term horizon because we want yes. to show to the, to the world that there is significant growth right. in the use of electronic bills of lading. Most of these companies have already exceeded 20%, uh, so we're well on target to getting this. But yes. this is you know, 20% of iron ore being shipped on electronic bills of lading already. It shows there is a huge interest in this, we have success already, and this is what this campaign is all about, Great. raising awareness, getting Thank more you. people on board yeah. to accept yeah. e-bills. And if you want to read more about that, you can find it on BIMCO's website at bimco.org slash ebl. So that's all we have time for today. Thank you for your questions. Sorry we couldn't answer everybody's questions. Uh, you can contact Grant at gh at bimco.org if you have any more specific questions. But thank you for taking the time to answer them. And remember, you can also sign up for our newsletters at bimco.org slash subscriptions and see other upcoming BIMCO live events and recorded events uh, at bimco.org slash events. And in fact, one of those is on the 6th of March with you also talking about e-bills of lading again, but in a much uh, uh, more specific way, which you can see on the website. So thank you very much for joining us and goodbye from Ebco.